Hello and welcome to the Arsenal Ramble podcast where today we're going to be doing a preview into the blockbuster fixture that we've got coming this Wednesday against, well, none other than Manchester City, our number one rival when it comes to the title uh, in this particular season. But it's a team that we've had a, a bit of a thorn in our side really with this team over the last, well, eight seasons because we've not actually beaten them in the league since, well... 2015. So uh, mm. that's uh, a, a bit of a uh, bad stat to start the podcast with. But to join me as <laughs> ever, we've got we've got Dave, uh, my co-rambler. How you doing, mate? You all right? Yes, I'm all good, mate. I'm all good, thanks. Yeah, that's a, it's not the best way to start, but you know, it's facts, isn't it, at the end of the day? Um, I've, got, I've actually got some of the players that were in that game as well. Um, none other than Joel Campbell um, <laughs> played in that game, if you remember, the, remember that guy. Um, Walcott, Urzel, Giroud, Flamini. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was a, a two assists from Urzel, Walcott goal, a, a Giroud goal, and a 2 1 win for the Arsenal. But all the way back in 2015, yeah, it just seems crazy that it's that long ago that we've actually been able to beat this colossus of a side, isn't it? But I, mm. I feel like now more than ever, we've got the best chance of doing it. I think we're a much well definitely a much better side than we were back in 2015 I think if you're trying to swap out Flamini for Thomas Partey for example we've got <laughs> we've got a much better team now and we're more well equipped to be able to contend in these sort of matches um as we have against a lot of the top six this season so if if anything that is a bit of confidence for us going into Wednesday but we're going to be talking team sheets and tactics and things like that um initially mm. Going into the game, uh, I think, w- would you want to make any changes to our starting eleven? Because after the last couple of games, it seems like we need to freshen up, really, don't we? Yeah, I think the biggest one for me, and it's probably the the biggest debate online at the minute, is whether we should start Trossard over Martinelli. Um, mm. A lot of people saying, you know, he's he's done well in in his in the in the few minutes that he's had coming off the bench. Um, he obviously just scored against Brentford, um, albeit a goal that he didn't really create himself. It was a, a tap in essentially, uh, and one that Martinelli probably would have scored had he been in in the exact same position. It was good work from Saka, um, if we're being honest. So, um, but you take that away, and, and, and what he has done individually has been has been something that I haven't seen in a, in a player for a long time. It's, it reminds me of Santi Cazorla, how he's got really quick feet and little bursts mm. of pace. And he's always looking to do something. And, and it, that, it's not one dimensionally. He'll try to take you on the left. He'll try to cut inside and, and drive towards that centre spot and look for a pass or an outlet. So with Martinelli not quite being in form at the minute, um, it's certainly something that I wouldn't be opposed to. But on the flip side... This game does sort of play to Martinelli's strengths. Um, if you remember in that game a couple of seasons ago, um, when Gabriel got sent off and um, Rodri ended up scoring in the in the dying seconds, and we ended up losing, um, we were by far the better team that day. Should have should have won, and Martinelli was all over them. They could not handle him, and. And although he's not on form, this could be the sort of game where they're not quite, you know, we're not playing against a Brentford or an Everton that are going to play this low block. They're going to attack us and it might just give him that license to be able to show what he can do a bit more. So it's a hard one. I I really can't call it and I I don't think he can really make a wrong decision. So what what do you think? Yeah, it's really interesting you say that because it's, a bit of a dilemma between choosing either Martinelli or Trossard in this game because, as we've seen in recent weeks, Martinelli really hasn't been up to it. He's not been he's not been half the player that he's been for the rest of the season. However, that's been playing against these negative low block teams where he doesn't have the space to get in behind. He doesn't have, um, you know, he doesn't have the options to be able to open open up and run into grass essentially. Um, mm. So, it. it it is such a dilemma, really, because if you're thinking Martinelli would be absolutely suited to this game. This is a perfect game for him to play because, you know, Man City, yeah. they're going to push up. They're going to leave spaces in behind and that's somewhere we can exploit. And to be honest, Trossard, for all of his qualities, 
He's not a sprinter. He's not a runner. He's not going to be able to dart in behind as well as a player like Martinelli could do. Uh, and mm. with him having that constant threat on the counter, it means that Man City can't absolutely dominate us. They can't, you know, pressure us to the point where we can't even get out because there's going to be that outpour. So it's it's going to be there's so many mind games before the game as well because mm. of how tactically, you know, amazing both of our coaches are. And, you know, they're going to be psyching each other out and they, they know each other very well. So they're going to be basically playing mental chess before we even get into the game. And that does start with the team sheet. So it, mm. it is it is a really tough decision and I don't want to be the one that has to make it, to be honest. But <laughs> there, there, in fact, there's, there is also even a case to have them both starting. And uh, bear mm. with me on this. Um, <laughs> I, I saw... Well, I heard something earlier about how um, in Ketia, he's played so many minutes, basically every minute since, well, Christmas, since the Gabriel Jesus thing came about. And he's looking pretty knackered. He's not looking too sharp. If anything, he's a contributing factor to Martinelli not playing as well as he should be, really. So there is a case for potentially taking Nketiah out because we're playing two games, well, three games in a week and um, replacing him with either Trossard, who's played a nine before at Brighton, or maybe giving Martinelli a shot up top. So there is, yeah. you know, there's, there's license for that to happen as well. So what do you think on that? Do you think that's something, a route that we might be able to go down or? Yeah, yeah it's certainly an option. I think that was one of the the key reasons why we went for Trossard because of his versatility the fact that he has played that position before in the past for for Brighton and, and even um, for Belgium at times. Um, so it is something that, yeah, um, that we probably will need to consider sooner than later because, like you, like you say, we, we've not really had to worry about the the two games a week thing for, for, for a while now. We've, we've been quite lucky, actually, with that. Um, but now we've got a midweek fixture. Um, and then we've got the Europa League coming up. Um, so Eddie can't play ninety minutes every single game. And in fact, he hasn't actually played. He hasn't played consistent football for uh, you know for ninety minutes over more than maybe ten games ever, has he? Um, no. So this isn't a player that's particularly used to that. And this may be part of the reason why we're having that little bit of a drop off with Eddie because he's. He's a young lad, and he's just not his body's not quite used to 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 playing this amount of minute this these amount of minutes on on the pitch. So, um, especially when you consider how amazing he was playing in in those in that in the game against Man United and in the game against Tottenham, he was absolutely brilliant in that game. He he was linking up with players a hell of a lot more. We weren't talking about the Jesus thing then. Because it was like, you know, we've got Eddie, he's firing goals and he's linking up with play. <laughs> and now now all of a sudden the form's dipping a little bit and you're seeing him not quite as sharp as he was. Um, and we're sort of desperate to see Jesus back, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Um, especially in this game, because I think we mentioned it in the um, the post-match podcast after the Brentford game and, and how it would be so nice to have that that returning player uh, elements, uh, Jesus and, and City, uh, they, they've always got that extra little want to get revenge. Not revenge. That's probably the wrong wrong word, but that just extra <laughs> little edge about them. Uh, they want to prove prove the point of you know you should have let me go. Um, but luckily we've got Zinchenko as well that can uh, that can also do that. But um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I do think he will stick with Eddie, but I wouldn't be surprised if we. We we see a substitution that maybe um, reflects these sort of changes and maybe try and keep Trossard on the pitch as well as Martinelli and Saka. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That would be really interesting to see. And I know what you mean about the Jesus thing. It would add an extra little bit mm. of needle to the game, wouldn't it? Uh, which yeah. has already got a lot of needle because of our league positions and everything that's going on with Man City, and you know the fact that we've not really contended with them too much until last season and. But the only times we were actually beating them was in the FA Cups, for example. But then they knocked us out of the FA Cups. So it makes us want mm. that little bit of revenge in the league. And it's the first time that we've met them in the league this season. So it's going to be a really, really interesting contest. But one thing that I did find was quite interesting as well was um, 
when Man City played this weekend, they didn't really field a left back. Uh, they, in fact, I think Bernardo Silva was covering on that left side for most of the game against Villa. Mm. So that would be, a, 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 well, for me, I think that would be an oversight if they did that with the likes of Bukayo Saka on the right hand side. So uh, Pep's mm. changing his team; he's changing his system all the time. So I do think he. He'll probably make the sensible idea of playing Nathan Ake like he did in the cup against Saka. But if he didn't, and we do have, we're, we're attacking maybe a back three, then that could be someone we could exploit. Yeah, in that game that I mentioned earlier about when we were when Gabriel got sent off and we re- we really deserved that win that day. I remember Saka absolutely destroying Ake, uh, mm. and it was a real focus um, that we targeted that side. Um, but this season, he started to become a, a much better player. And obviously, we saw you know his offensive um, attributes. But you know he even scored against us in the FA Cup. Um, but defensively, he has improved vastly. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the difficult thing with City is hard to predict that what they're going to be doing because they've just got such strength in numbers and, and, it, and they can swap players out and it doesn't really affect things massively. The, the one thing that that will be intriguing is if these um, Haaland, because he went off at half time, I believe, in that Villa game with a, a little bit of a, an injury worry. So what will be interesting is if um, he comes out, who, who replaces Haaland? I mean, the natural, the obvious thing, uh, player would be um, Alvarez, is it? The, uh, the Alvarez, Argentinian. Yeah. yeah, so, and and to be honest, Part of me is more worried about that than than the prospect of Haaland. Um, and I know that sounds strange, but Haaland, you know what you know what you're getting is he's, he's not going to be on the ball too much. If you can mark him out of the game, then you effectively nullify one of their main attacking threats. Having said that, they've got so many other options. But you know, um, I'd be much more worried about an Alvarez than a Haaland at this point in time to be honest so that that's the main thing that's really going to um intrigue me about their their starting lineup yeah yeah and i've heard a lot of debate actually this season about people saying that city are a better team when harland isn't in it but then mm. it just seems so strange because he's got upwards of 25 goals this season so it's like mm. how can they be a better team without him in it and you saw like even with the um, the first goal they scored against Villa the other day, where he he skips and his acceleration to get round the keeper was unbelievable. It's like Usain Bolt just like gliding mm-hmm. through the penalty area and uh, putting it uh, uh, on a plate sort at the back stick. So he he is a top quality player, and I I do think we will have to have an eye on him if he is playing. Um, however, if Saliba and Gabriel are on top form, I think they've got more than they're more than capable to be able to deal with him. So that mm. that is one thing that will be a really good contest to be able to see. Um, I would be more worried, actually, about their wide players. It seems like yeah. um, like Mares seems to always mm. score against us, even when he was at Leicester. It, it, he's, just, he's that sort of player that always has an eye for goal against us. And um, it will be a tough game on that side because Zinchenko, we know, he likes to push in. He likes to get into the midfield and step in and leave the area exposed. So... That yeah. is somewhere where we might be, uh, you know, it might be a bit of a fragile area for Arsenal on the counter or if they're dominating. And uh, Zinchenko, for all his qualities going forward, he's competent at defending, but he's not the best defensive player in the league. So that is somewhere yeah. where I, I'm i a little bit worried about as well. Yeah. Another thing to think about as well is, is this like, this little dark arts that Man City have, this this little dive in a box every now and again. You remember it with Bernardo Silva with the shirt pull, um, oh, yeah. you know, buying that penalty, getting them back into the game. Um, and, and, and in the Aston Villa game, Jack Grealish, of all players, diving against his home, his boyhood club. Um, and it was the most obvious dive I've seen in a long time. He, he effectively yeah. clips himself um, over... You know, by just knocking his other leg into, you know, into himself. So, it, I, I just think if he's doing that to his boyhood club, like they have got no remorse, have they? Um, and it's no, just, it's, um, it's something we're really going to have to keep an eye on. That um, Saliba and Gabriel are going to be um, 
be wary of that because I think that's what something that they'll try and do, especially with Mares. Like you say, he's a tricky, tricky player. Um, and one little um, tug of the shirt or a little bit of contact, and he, he's going down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. It has the feel of it. This game that it's going to be settled by some sort of either controversial decision or penalty or red card or something like that. It, it usually does when these two teams meet, especially as you were saying that game last season in January where we we looked like and well. We look way better than Manchester City for about sixty minutes. We look, we blew them away, yeah. didn't we? First half, um, mm-hmm. and then we had that rubbish red card decision on Gabriel, and yeah, it just kind of flipped on its head. They had that penalty, and then unfortunately, we uh, conceded last minute to Rodri. But mm. I feel like we're right in a lot of wrongs this season, and this is you know one of one of the last skeletons in the closet to uh, you know put to bed kind of thing that we, we've not actually done done one over Manchester City in so long which we've we've done that against so many teams this season like we've we beat Spurs away and uh, we've beaten all like the top six well we're beating like Manchester United and beating Liverpool, yeah, Liverpool. so it's it just yeah. Chelsea so it just we it would be amazing if we could come away with three points but it's, it's one of those games where for us it's it's a must not lose because we don't want City to gain on any ground on us, to be honest. I, I mm. actually would be happy to take the draw before the game. I think the pressure really is on Manchester City to win because they they can see us just slipping away from them. If if they don't win this game, then you know we're, we're still ahead of them. We're still three points ahead with a game in hand, which, let's be real, when it comes... When we, Rewind back to Christmas Day. Everybody was absolutely buzzing at the fact that we were five points clear of Manchester City on Christmas Day, uh, and we had the same games played. So we've played, I yeah. think, six or seven games since then. So we're further down the line, and we're still three points ahead, but we've got a game in hand. So that could potentially mm. be six points, which is like the equivalent difference of li- the equivalent points of lead that we had on Christmas Day, which everyone was buzzing about. But now, we're, yeah. because we've had these few uh, dodgy performances, everyone's mm. losing their minds, thinking that <laughs> we're, we're bottling it, we're throwing it away, but we're literally, we've got the same lead as we did then. Yeah, and, and if you think back to um, the World Cup when we found out that Jesus has sustained this this massive injury, we were thinking, that's it then, title race mm. is gone. We've lost our star man, our star signing of the summer. Um, you know, and it was all a little bit like, well, oh, might as well just give up now. That well, it's not quite <laughs> what people were saying, but it's, it's the vibe that was being given off. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and if you'd have been told, you know, mid February, you're you're going to be in this situation points wise with a game in hand on City, I don't think many Arsenal fans would have not taken that. Um, you know, we're we're only maybe four weeks away from from the return of Jesus as well. Uh, which is going to be a massive boost. Um, Smith Rowe too. Um, you'd like to think he's going to start um, getting some more minutes now. He's he's um, training again properly. Um, so we've got some we've got some big boosts to add to this team. Um, and if we can just start getting into gear again, um, then I really think and, and this this game is also massive from from that point of view as well. Because if we can get a win in this game and really get back into gear again. And that tends to be what happens with Arsenal. We go on a little run of, in the past anyway, over the last few seasons, we go on these little, little runs of of losses and draws, you know, and you know we'll lose one nil to Burnley, but then the, in a week later we'll we'll play Chelsea, um, and, and we'll smash them, and then we'll go on another ten game run of not losing. So I'm yeah. hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping that that it's it's going to be something like that. Yeah, and I think um, Alan Shearer said it on the coverage the other day, basically saying that this is probably the perfect game for Arsenal to play right now. If, if yeah. anything, it would be a better game to play than, say, like Crystal Palace away. Because, you know, after you've had two rubbish results against, you know, physical negative teams, to play another one of those away, it, you, you could get stuck in a rut and you could keep having those performances. But mm. All of the guys know that they're going to have to step up their level on Wednesday. They know they're playing what is, well, second best team in the league by table standards, but they've been the best team 
over the last decade or so. Um, so I, I do think it's a, a perfect time for us to play them because it's going to, you know, if we do end up winning the game, it's going to reinvigorate us. And as you say, we've got 10 very winnable games following this game. And if we had to go on a massive run after winning this game, then, you know, it, it is like we're coming into the final stretch of the season and we will still have a points, uh, a point cushion, a few points cushion, won't we? So, yeah. yeah. A lot of a lot of the media are, are sort of bigging up Man City now, um, just because they've beat um, Aston Villa at home, uh, saying that they're, you know they're back, they're back, uh, and, and they're going to take this title charge by storm. And, and it's like, hang on, a, hang on a minute, you, they just lost to Tottenham um, and dropped points at you know at other teams as well. Bearing in mind, we've dropped points to Everton and Brentford. We were taking one point off over those two games. How many points did Man City take over them two games? One point as well. They also dropped points to to both of those teams. So, you know, they're tough. They're tough teams to play. I know Everton haven't been necessarily, and it's it's annoying that we didn't get to play Lampard's Everton. <laughs> um, but um, you know, they they are Brentford are a, a good team, and and. You know, like like I was just saying, we've we've come out of it in in a position where we're we're still fighting for it, and if we can just if we can even get a point, we're still in a very healthy position, um, and we've got some you'd like to say winnable games coming up as well. So yeah, you know, it's it's not we need. I, you could tell in the stadium that the fans are a little bit deflated as well. I, I you know we was watching on on telly so. We were in the stadium, but you could just you could just see the 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 nerves and and that sort of energy being sapped from mm. from what what could happen in this game because you know the performances have dipped, um, and I think this is the this is the time to really get behind the lads um, and uh, and just stamp our authority. Yeah. Oh yeah, and I'm going to be completely behind them on Wednesday. I'm going to be so excited mm. for the game, but it, yeah. it, it's one of those things as well where. I think you're delusional if you think that Arsenal were going to maintain an eight-point cushion ahead of the second team in the league and then, you know, just have a, a an easy ride all the way to the finish line with no bumps in the mm. road at all. This was always going to happen. There's always going to be a stage where your team gets mentally tested, you get physically tested, uh, you could have injuries, you could have outrageous refereeing decisions, which we have had. Um, and, and sometimes you have adversity against your team and what you need to do in these situations is use that as fuel and spin it yeah. into the players' minds and just say, look, it's us against the world. We're going to go out there, we're going to perform and we're going to be able to win these next, well, how many games we've got left? <laughs> win, the, oh. win the next 20 or so games uh, yeah. or pick up as many points as we possibly can and uh, yeah it, it was never going to be easy uh, and winning the Premier League title isn't easy and if anything if you know if we were hearing this this time last year we were saying we we're going to be five point well three points clear at the top of the table with the point with the chance to make it six over City on Wednesday to have a game in hand as well you'd say you're absolutely crazy there's no chance we're we're going to be in that position this time next year but we are mm. and we are here yeah. by merit so yeah let's 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 do it yeah, let's do it. What about score predictions? I'm curious to to um to hear what you think with with that one. What you what you're saying? Oh, that's a tricky one. So I don't think it'll be a high scoring game. Um, I think it's going to be mm. quite a cagey affair. So I don't. If I was to if I was to do a score prediction, I would go probably two two one Arsenal. That's what I would say if I was to do a score prediction, just because I don't think we're going to keep City out for 90 minutes. I think at some point they're going to have either like a sweaty penalty decision or so, some sort of, especially over the last few weeks of what we've seen with our defending, um, I think they're going, to, they're going to get in. They're going to have chances and they've got the quality of players to be able to convert those chances. So I think City will mm. score, but I think we will score too. <laughs> what yeah. about you? Yeah, I actually agree on the score line. I think it will be two one. Also, I think it'll be like a an early, not on a maybe halfway through the first half, we'll get a 
we'll get a goal. Um, we'll go into the break one nil up, and then I think they'll they'll peg us back and and equalise, um, and then we'll get one sort of around the seventieth. Uh, I know this is very specific. <laughs> it's, just how, it's just how I feel it's going to go. Um, and then it'll be Rob Holding time and, uh, <laughs> and we'll uh, manage to keep keep it this time and not suffer that last minute death. Okay. Well, if, if we're talking cr- chronology of the goals, then uh, I actually think that we'll go 2 0 up and then we will concede in the 70th minute. And then it will be Rob holding time because it will be squeaky bum time after having such a comfortable lead for such a long time. And we're going to, yeah. you know, we're going to be so stressed out for the last 20 minutes, half an hour of the game. Uh, just yeah. like every game, really. We, we, I'm always stressed out until it finishes. But if, if I was to put my money on it, that's what I think. That's what I think would happen uh, on Wednesday. Yeah, I'm just hoping for no um, ref blunders because after this weekend... I just don't think I can take it anymore. I mean, I don't want to bang on about refs all the time because it does get a little bit boring. Um, but it was probably one of the worst weekends the uh, the, the refs have had in, in, a, in a long time. And um, I'm just hoping that we don't have anything like that. But what, hopefully we've got some sort of goodwill built up. Uh, so we might get a cheeky little uh, <laughs> little pedo or something like that. <laughs> I was just about to say, do you think that that's going to be playing in the referees' minds, thinking that there's been so much scrutiny over the last weekend um, with all the bad decisions? Do you think maybe the refs might be more reluctant to give, um, say, if there's a, a like a, a penalty shout, they might be more reluctant to actually give it and rely more on VAR mm. because they're thinking, oh, well, I don't want to make the wrong decision here. Um, so I'm just going to rely on the guy that's in the in the uh, VAR stand. But then, you know, that was the issue in the first place. So exactly, yeah. do, do you think no, it's going to play into the mind at all? Or I hope not, because this is the the mistakes that they make. They they can't let emotion come into the game. They've just got to accept the fact that they've made mistakes and move mm. on. Like we can't do anything about it. Hence why we're not putting a formal complaint in. I think Arteta has just said, "Look, thanks for your apology, Mister Howard Webb." But yeah. Um, it means nothing, you know. Unfortunately, because we can't do anything about the scoreline, we can't get, we can't get our points back. So we might as well yeah. just accept it, take it on the chin, move on, and it shouldn't affect any future games because that's the whole point of refereeing. It has to just be honest, and and there are elements to calls where judgments are going to be a little bit personal. I mean, if you remember in that um, Brentford game when they actually scored a disallowed goal, um, there was sort of a foul on Gabriel in the build-up. A lot of people said that that was a foul, uh, soft. Some people said it wasn't a foul. It's a judgment. And, and I don't. I, I kind of agreed with the, um, um, the on-field decision, but if it had gone the other way, I could also see reasons why it would have gone that way. So do you know what I'm saying? But with what mm. happened in our game, it was factual. The lines weren't drawn. It should have been offside. That should never have happened, um, and and these are the sorts of things that they have to get right. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I, I'm obviously joking about having some sort of goodwill banked, but um, <laughs> who knows? You know, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I heard the word um, corruption thrown around a lot and conspiracies <laughs> with these refs, so you, you never quite know. I'm, I'm not tend to. I don't tend to be one of those people that thinks that sort of stuff. No, yeah, I, I, and I also I do think it was a, a good idea from Mikel Arteta to not give any backlash towards him, but just because you know, as you say, there might be some further influential decisions made from if he was to you know go against them. But um, I've heard that there's going to be um, a ban on Lee Mason, you know, ever refereeing an Arsenal game ever in the future. No, it's not. I, w- I wish, I wish, I wish that was yeah. happening. But um, yeah, it's yeah. just he's, it's just him. He just seems to be one of them. One of those. It, I, I saw as well. There was a stat that um, the, there's not a single Premier League referee that's from the London area at all. Uh, all of the referees in the PG MOL, they're from the like the northwest Manchester. area around Manchester. There's a couple yeah. from like maybe around Bristol, but apart from that. Why are there no mm. referees from London? I, I know that's it's just nitpicking, really. But one thing that I do think is strange, um, especially when I'm going a bit off piece here, but especially when 
you watch things like the World Cup and you watch the Euros, there's so many really, really top level foreign referees. Uh, and when you watch some of the games, like even in the uh, Champions League and things like that, the, the refereeing level there is it's amazing. You know, they make yeah. so many more decent calls and the VAR is sped up. It takes less than 20, 30 seconds and the majority of the time they make the right call. Do you reckon there's scope for maybe having some foreign referees come into the Premier League just because you know they're not going to have any affiliations with any of the Premier League teams because they're not from here? Do you know what I mean? So is that something that you'd yeah. like to see happen in the future? 100%. I don't know why it isn't. Like this is the Premier League. This is the biggest league in the world, the most lucrative league in the world. We can attract the best, most you know. If you were to have our league as British only, for example, the quality of players, I mean, the qual- the quality would be awful. So you've got <laughs> British only referees. The quality is awful. That's because <laughs> the, the, I know that sounds strange, but like. It's true. This is an elite league. We can afford to get elite referees from wherever they're from. It doesn't matter, you know. They should be they should be refing in the best leagues, at the best tournaments, um, and to to reduce that pool of people to just British only. Why? I don't I don't know why you would do that. Um, you know, like like the best. The best players from all over the world are in the Premier League. The best managers, the best coaching staff, even sports scientists are from all over the world in in these clubs. So why why have yeah. just British refs? It yeah. is yeah. There's a, there's a couple of good refs. Don't get me wrong in the league, but there's also a hell of a lot of rubbish ones um, that that are no way near the level of Premier League. No way near, you know, lower league at best. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it baffles me. I don't know why. I, I, it it really is a, a strange yeah, yeah. one I, for me. That that is just something that I, I have always thought. Like, why do we not have foreign refs? You know, it, 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 it's something which it would be such a step up in quality. And and just for the simple fact of knowing that they don't have any affiliation or any hidden agenda because they don't. Well, you don't know if they don't support any team, but it's more than likely that they're not going to have any affiliation with British teams, uh, English teams, um, compared to British refs. Do you know what I mean? So that is something that I've always just wondered. But um, yeah, enough about referees anyway, because it's just going to it's going to upset me about uh, (laughs) you know going over their decisions and points that we've dropped because of their decisions. But um, so. Wednesday, we're going to be playing against Manchester City. Is there uh, anything else you can think of coming uh, into the build-up for this game? Or no, I think about. I think we've covered about just everything. Just, um, just got my fingers crossed that we can just get through this rut and uh, and really put one over them. Because, like, like we said at the start, it's been too long in the league, and um, I'm hoping now is our time. Yeah, so it's been too long. Too long in the league. That was a bit of a tongue twister. But hopefully we can right our wrongs on Wednesday evening. And afterwards, we're going to be doing a post-match podcast. So join us for that one again. Uh, If you guys want to follow us on YouTube, it's at the Arsenal Ramble. And again, on Twitter, it's at the Arsenal Ramble underscore. Uh, Not at the Arsenal Ramble, at Arsenal Ramble underscore. (laughs) (laughs) Thought I'd get that one in there. Uh, Thanks, guys. Join us next time. Okay. Take care, guys. Bye.